The Jewish Channel's Week in Review. Another baby infected as a result of a rare circumcision ritual. Art stolen by the Nazis is reclaimed. An artist you need to hear about. And more of the Jewish news that's changing your world right now in this episode of the Week in Review. Hello and welcome to the Jewish Channel's Week in Review. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. Another baby has been infected with herpes as the result of a rare and controversial circumcision practice maintained by some ultra-Orthodox, according to the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. The City Department of Health, which has been the key agency on this issue going back to 2005, announced this week that it has received a new report of herpes simplex transmitted to an infant in December of 2012 that resulted from the practice of mitzitza buffet, or direct oral suction, of the circumcision wound. It's a practice forbidden for health reasons by most rabbis, but maintained despite the reported health risks by some ultra-Orthodox mohels. This is the 12th such infection reported to the City Department of Health over the past 12 years. Of those 12 infections, two resulted in death and a further two resulted in brain damage. The Department of Health did not report any significant long-term harm resulting from this latest infection. The practice of direct oral suction of the circumcision wound has generated a great amount of political heat for the City Department of Health in the past year, as the department has been trying to implement a policy of handing a brochure to parents of newborns while they're in the hospital that would inform the parents of the risks of this practice, and to have the parents sign a waiver acknowledging they are aware of the risks involved. The pushback from the ultra-Orthodox community has led to delays in implementing this policy, which could also be difficult to implement on First Amendment grounds. Several ultra-Orthodox groups sued the city and federal court in the fall of last year to prevent implementation of the policy, and the judge granted a temporary stay. After oral arguments in late December, the judge said she would issue her ruling within weeks, which means it could come any day now. Meantime, in Israel, an ultra-Orthodox controversy surrounds the upcoming election there over the issue of whether the ultra-Orthodox should be drafted into the army, just like all other Jewish Israeli citizens. The government of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has been delaying on this issue for several months beyond an August deadline from the Israeli Supreme Court for establishing a new law requiring equal national service requirements for ultra-Orthodox Israelis as for other Jewish Israelis. And with the most likely election results seeming to become increasingly inevitable, the two largest figures in the election, Netanyahu and Habayit Hayhudi party leader Naftali Bennett, are both suggesting they won't draft the ultra-Orthodox. Separate and apart from any ideological arguments, the most likely government coalition coming out of the elections would assemble Netanyahu's and Bennett's parties with ultra-Orthodox parties to achieve a majority in the Knesset. And that means those ultra-Orthodox parties are essentially pulling the strings. The Netanyahu government filed a brief this week explaining its position opposing drafting the ultra-Orthodox, saying that the amount of funds required to impose a large-scale draft of the ultra-Orthodox would be financially damaging to the Israel Defense Forces. The brief stated, quote, Making the IDF divert such funds to facilitate this change will infringe on its ability to meet its primary missions and goals. What are those extra costs? The need for the IDF to set up bases and screening procedures that meet the ultra-Orthodox demand for absolute gender segregation. Building dedicated bases, creating men-only battalions, and having only male interviewers and doctors as part of the conscription process, the government says, would cost too much money. And as to Bennett, who's likely to become a major part of what is likely to be the next Netanyahu government, he said in a recent interview on ultra-Orthodox radio in Israel, we will be a partner which will fight for Torah study in Israel, and we will fight against laws that coerce service. Whoever is learning Torah should continue to learn Torah, full stop. In other Israel news, an underage prostitution ring involving dozens of girls has led to many arrests this week. Tel Aviv police raided 10 homes of regular clients of the prostitution ring, which specialized in providing girls between the ages of 14 and 16 to clients requesting such girls. The 10 men arrested may face charges of statutory rape. The ringleader is allegedly a 20-year-old woman who was also arrested by police. Police say the ring operated for years, serving a dedicated clientele of men as young as 20 and as old as 60. The girls are being provided with individual social workers. Moving on to a crime story that's decades old, the confiscation of Jewish property by the Nazis led to notorious cases of art theft. Christian Neen reports on one collection that's back together. A collection of posters which began their existence a century ago as simple printed advertisements have survived long enough to become valuable works of art, and they owe their longevity to the late Hans Sachs, a German-Jewish art collector whose sprawling poster collection is coming up for a once-in-a-lifetime series of auctions beginning January 18th, 19th, and 20th at the Bohemian National Hall on East 73rd Street in Manhattan. 
Guernsey's auction house is handling the sale of 1,233 posters collected by Saks, which are on the block for the three-day unreserved auction, the first of three equally-sized Guernsey auctions of Saks posters in 2013. Guernsey president Arlen Ettinger talked to TJC about what makes the Saks collection special. The Saks collection, universally recognized as the finest collection of posters in the world, are not only great because of their graphics and the stories that each tell, but because of the enormous history that they represent, the, what, what these fragile pieces of paper have gone through. Their history hinges on the Jewish identity of the man who collected them. Sachs organized the world's first poster collecting society in 1910, and his own collection eventually grew to thousands of posters, including many by famous artists, which attained great value. In November 1938, during Kristallnacht, Sachs was put in the Sachsenhausen concentration camp and his collection seized. Though he managed to gain release from the camp before the outbreak of World War II and came to the U.S., his collection was lost to him, even to his death in 1974. But the collection resurfaced after the fall of the Berlin Wall at the German Historical Museum, and Sachs's son Peter won a court case last year, granting its return to the family, which is auctioning them through Guernsey's. There are 4,300 posters in the collection, uh, five or six hundred are going to be given away to different museums, while the balance, uh, 3,750, are, are being divided into three groups, uh, sold at public auction. Unless someone contacts Guernsey's right off the bat and wants to buy the whole collection to gift it to a museum, which would be wonderful if that were to happen. Among those Saks posters, which any art museum would prize, are extremely rare examples from the German secession movement. Posters from the secession movement announcing exhibitions, art exhibits, and gallery shows um, are so rare that in thinking about this, We've concluded, if you see one poster, one secession poster, every few years that come to public auction, it's a big deal. Uh, this collection uh, has roughly 20 or 30 secession posters, of which this beauty uh, is, is right there. There it is. To see more from the soon-to-be-sold Saks poster collection and to find out how you can buy a piece of it, Please tune into the full broadcast edition of the Week in Review. Thank you, Christian. Rebecca Honig Friedman reports on one Jewish artist whose name you should know Jackson Pollock, Willem de Kooning, and Ruth Abrams. Even if you're well versed in the school of art known as Abstract Expressionism, you probably haven't heard the name of that last artist. But an exhibit at the Yeshiva University Museum is hoping to change that. She was kind of always in the background and still is until this show. Microcosms, Ruth Abrams' abstract expressionist, is a retrospective of American-born Jewish painter Ruth Abrams' life's work, giving her, finally, what she always thought was her due as a significant artist of the period, according to her longtime friend and now executor of her estate, Susan Haar. She was uh, furious, enraged, that she could not get the recognition which she believed her work deserved, and not her as a person, but her work. And she felt that this was a condition that was true in general for women, and most particularly for women artists who were not included in the scene, in the group, in the club, and the club is a word that she used. Abrams did get her work seen in gallery shows, including solo exhibitions and screenings of her film Microcosms around the world. But she never became a big name as she wanted to be, and the experience and struggles of women were a major focus of her paintings. She was, uh, I would say, a very early feminist, a strong one. She lived very independently. She made independent choices in her personal life. She had an unusual relationship with her husband and in certain respects with her kids. Uh, she was not maternal in any traditional way. Abrams was married not to an artist, but to New York City's first urban planner, Charles Abrams, who, if not getting her into the Boys Artist Club by association, did afford her a lifestyle conducive to artistic pursuits. She had a salon in her house. They lived very well. They lived in the M.A. Lazarus mansion on 10th Street, and she invited artists, you know, and it would socialized with them. She fed, she liquored, she took care of, she teased all kinds of people. 
with no regard to station, people were included of all sorts. As Abrams was inclusive, this show seeks to include her in the canon of abstract expressionist painters. Accordingly, exhibit curator Reba Walken chose works to highlight Abrams' focus on abstract expressionist concerns. The struggle between the abstract and the figurative, and also um, the tensions between color and space. So the show moves chronologically, actually, from her earlier works, where she's investigating space, and um, to the feminine theme, where she has the Great Mother series and her daughter Judy and Jeans, and then to her um, major series, which we think is her strongest, is the Microcosms, which we titled the show after. For more on Microcosms, Ruth Abrams' Abstract Expressionist, which is at the Yeshiva University Museum through April 21st, watch the full broadcast version of The Week in Review. Thank you, Rebecca. Finally, a professor who has raised the profile of Yiddish literature, anthologized Jewish fiction, and become a leading expert on Latino culture has a new subject he's tackling, the so-called crypto-Jews, whose religious identity was kept secret while facing persecution in Spain in the 15th century, through to the conquistadors coming to the Americas, and right up through the founding of New Mexico to today. In a new graphic novel murder mystery, El Illuminado, Elon Stavins takes an untraditional approach to broaching a new topic. He recently stopped by the studio for an interview, and here are the highlights. So this graphic novel tackles a topic that we've seen a few times here on the Jewish Channel that, that's really uh, generating an, an immense amount of controversy across a, a number of fields, and that is the idea of the crypto-Jews of the Southwest here in the United States. Uh, and so what 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 message are you trying to, to get across about your take uh, on the crypto Jews? <laughs> well, it's a novel, and as such, it is fiction. And I don't know if I have a particular message that I want to uh, send out. And if there is, clearly there are a number of them. Uh, in a novel, the reader is uh, will get them in different ways. Uh, this is a novel that explores the issues of identity uh, in the interface of Latino life and Jewish life here in the United States and also in the country that I was born, Mexico, uh, and how complicated, how tortured uh, and labyrinthine they might be. Uh, the issue of crypto Jews, as you will put, is, uh, is an explosive one. Are they? Are they not? Uh, should they be accepted? Uh, who are they? Where do they come from? How legitimate, how authentic is their claim? Uh, to Jewishness? Uh, do they connect with the Sephardic past, with the past of Spain? Um, are they, as it has been suggested, uh, really uh, byproducts of the 19th century, closer to Jews for Jesus, for instance, um, proselytizers and converters uh, in Arizona and Colorado and in the northern part of Mexico? Uh, but the novel doesn't really want to give an answer. The novel right. wants to present the issue and let the readers figure it out. So let's get, let's step back for a second and just talk about exactly what the crypto Jews are. They, and, it, and it starts with the Inquisition. It goes all the way back to the 15th century in Spain. Mm -hmm. The crypto Jews are, uh, in my view, an extraordinary phenomenon in the history of the uh, the Jews and in the history of, uh, of Western civilization. Um, in the coexistence, la convivencia, that uh, Jews and Christians and Muslims had in Spain for over six centuries, uh, there was a tacit uh, peaceful agreement between the three major religions. And at one point, uh, Spain uh, moved emphatically to become a nation, and as such, it aligned itself under a single religion, uh, Christianity, and that resulted in the expulsion or the obliteration of the other two. First, the Jews, who were expelled from Spain in 1492, and then uh, the Muslims, uh, not uh, too much, too, too long uh, later. And uh, the crucial player here is the Holy Office of the Inquisition that had as it, at its mission the, the keeping of the rules uh, really aligned with the state uh, of what Christianity ought to be and uh, how connected religion should become with the concept of the nation. And um, those two other religions, Islam and Judaism, faced the question of belonging or being thrown out. And in that uh, question, some who had been living uh, for quite a while in the peninsula 
opted for a hidden or secret or uh, um, a, a kind of a non-public uh, Jewish life. And in other, in, in other, ter in other words, they kept a, a double consciousness or a double presence. They were Catholic or Christians in public and they were uh, Jews in, in private. Um, and how long did this go? for quite a while and how close was this community i think this is one of the crucial aspects this was a, a kind of jewish community within the jewish community they were the the isolated characters within the the country as a whole that had to stick together and help each other uh, becoming a kind of club or an elite and in the end that elite really transformed modernity in dramatic ways in business uh, in theology we would not be who we are without the philosophical transformations of somebody like Spinoza, for instance, Baruch Spinoza, uh, and certainly in, in the, um, as merchants and as travelers in the Mediterranean. So crypto Jews might be something exotic for us, but it is crucial for people to realize that this was uh, a cadre of people, how many we are not sure, uh, that uh, stuck together, that felt rejected by a number of different entities, included uh, the, the, the Jewish establishment, in that uh, in, in creating, the, in coalescing as a group, really was able to transform a number of different disciplines and dimensions in ways that uh, have echoes uh, to this day. You can see the full interview with Elon Stobbins under the weekly news category on the Jewish Channel On Demand on cable. That's all for this week. From all of us here at the Jewish Channel, be well. The Jewish Channel is available on cable. Time Warner Cable Channel 528, IO Optimum Channel 291, RCN Channel 268, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, Cox Channel 1, Frontier Communications, and now on Comcast Cable in the On Demand menu under Premium Channels. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.